was really nervous about it at first, and I almost didn't take the job because I wasn't sure if I was ready, but doing it, like, it went really smoothly. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Almost two months after kicking the legal can down the dusty road, who is the villain of the story? I want you to consider this question as we deal with the 24-year-old armorer. So in this episode, we're going to deal extensively in detail with 24-year-old Hannah Gutierrez Reed. And we're going to get all of this information. It's rooted in fact. It's rooted in the latest affidavit, right? Have you noticed how affidavits read like narratives? People are introduced, plots play out, certain details are highlighted. In effect, an affidavit is a pitch to a judge anchored in real-life events featuring real-life people. And so, based on this real-life story, a judge decides whether to authorize law enforcement to take a particular kind of intervention or action. In the latest affidavit, we get a glimpse at Baldwin's story from a police perspective, as well as Hannah Gitterez Reed's involvement in the story. Curiously, the story we seem to know least about is perhaps the most important. There are whispers that the assistant director may be responsible in some way, and yet we know very little about Dave Hall's movements and position so far. Will that change? Time will tell. Before we get started on today's episode, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. You can click on the light blue icon on the bottom right of your screen, hit the notification bell for notifications, like, share, leave a comment, and let's get started. So Hannah's story, we go to the affidavit for that. Uh, I'm going to do that in a second just to let you know at the end of this episode, I will uh, let you know about a live stream I'm going to be doing where I'll be looking at specifically the three questions posed in the uh, recent documentary on ABC, The Deadly Take. And I'm going to give you the TCRS take on those three questions, the true crime rocket science position on those three critical positions. That live stream will either be around about two 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time Saturday or 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time Sunday. So in terms of Hannah's story from the affidavit, we get the following. Affiant interviewed multiple people in reference to the incident to include the armorer, that's Hannah Gutierrez reed the gun handler, Alec Baldwin, and the assistant director, David Halls. The set of Rust began filming on October 6th, 2021. Now, I think a name missing from there is Sarah Zachary, Hannah's co-worker, although she is mentioned in the next paragraph. So let's go to that. During Hannah's interview, she said the morning of the incident, the 21st of October 2021, she got to work and got the guns out. Hannah advised that her co-worker, Sarah Zachary, helped her out with the morning tasks. Hannah advised after they retrieved the guns, they took them to set. Hannah said while on set, she dummied the guns up with the dummy rounds. Hannah stated they got on set around 7.30 a.m., but didn't dummy the gun up until a short time before lunch. And so this is the situation once again, that lunch is playing kind of a role in this whole story. And I think a, a question one could ask is, was this lunch break something that could have interrupted attention spans, interrupted continuity, interrupted something that was systematic, such as checking six rounds. And I think another aspect that is relevant is this other person, the co-worker, Sarah Zachary. If you've got two people working on these guns, how do you know who is doing what? So, for example, if you've got one person doing something, they will know, well, if I haven't checked that, it's not been checked. But if you've got two people there may be an assumption that someone else did what needed to be done. Does that make sense? The other part that, as I say, is quite important is there might be this sense of uh, wanting to go to lunch, being aware of lunch, and in that sort of anticipation of going to lunch, your mind isn't completely on what you need to be doing. 
So in other words, the lunch literally interrupts this process. And when you come back, did you remember where you left off? Does that make sense? I also think it's quite interesting that Dave Halls is referred to by name in the affidavit and that's all. You may or may not be aware that Halls has had to be recently compelled to make a statement. So the person who would really know the most about what went on is probably the assistant director, the person who handed the gun to Baldwin and said cold gun, right? And so he's almost not mentioned at all here. And instead of Halls, we're getting the statement from Hannah. I do think what we're dealing with here is a battle between fact and fiction. Think about the incident itself. You have this fake cowboy scenario that actually leads to a real shooting. You have this scenario of um, all of these people collaborating to fake a cowboy being a badass in a church with, with Alec Baldwin at the center of that fakery, of that pageantry, of that uh, melodrama, right? And part of that fakery is using fake bullets, right? And then what happens? Reality intrudes and someone is actually shot in reality. And so something that has, has been set up as entertainment becomes reality in all of its horror, in all of its tragedy. And the person capturing the fakery is actually the, the, the victim, the person on the receiving end of this round. And then the cowboy says he was only doing what he was told to do by her. He didn't pull the trigger. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't have any intention. He didn't even know what had happened to her, right? Think about in a real cowboy movie, when somebody shoots someone else, do they know what they've done? Are they determined? Is it deliberate? In cowboy movies, you usually have one-on-one -on -one duels. Well, you have that happening here, except... It's one version of events dueling with another, but only one is true. Now let's go back to that affidavit, back to the narrative. Hannah advised when they all returned from lunch, Sarah pulled the gun out of the safe, the gun utilized by Alec, and handed it to her. Affiant asked Hannah if she loaded the gun after lunch, to which she stated, it was already loaded before they went to lunch. Hannah advised... We had the gun the whole time before that and nothing happened and I wasn't in there and they weren't even supposed to be putting the hammer back. And so what she's saying there is that she wasn't inside the church and they, no one was supposed to pull the hammer back. That's quite a good point. She goes on to say that Hannah was asked to clarify where the guns were located before lunch to which she responded they were inside with a camera crew and she was hardly allowed inside due to COVID precautions. Now, I think this is a very interesting um, thing that, that comes up here, the COVID precautions. I've said already that, you know, you see people in the last photo inside the church wearing masks. You see other scenarios during the, the shooting during the production of crew members wearing masks. You see the whole complaint about safety also extending to COVID precautions. And here you have it right at the center of this case in the sense of Hannah saying she didn't really have the opportunity to spend much time with the guns because she wasn't allowed really inside. And I think, I think she, what she's talking about here is she, she couldn't be inside the church due to COVID precautions. There could only be a limited amount of people. Does that make sense? And I'm, I must say, I don't really know whether if she had been inside, that would have made any difference to what ultimately happened. In any event, Hannah advised that she handed the gun to Alec a couple of times in the morning inside the set. Hannah said at one point, Dave Halls had the gun when he was sitting in for the shot. She advised she handed the gun off to Dave while he was sitting in, and this handoff occurred after lunch. So essentially you've got four people handling this particular weapon. It's Sarah who takes the gun out of the safe, then Hannah, then Dave Halls, and, and then also Alec Baldwin. And between that you have Hannah and Alec Baldwin um, 
handling the weapon as well. But you have those four individuals handling it. I must say, I do find it quite incredible that between four individuals, there's not one that absolutely confirms that the gun is safe, meaning uh, shaking each one of the bullets because it, it sort of makes like a clicking sound because there's something inside it. And so if you shake each bullet, you're going to get that sound. And that is going to tell you that the rounds are dummy rounds, that all six rounds are dummy rounds. Now, I, I do still want to take you through the mechanism of the Colt 45. For those of you who may not be aware of it, I'm still going to take you through that. But going back to the affidavit, Affiant asked Hannah when the last time was that she loaded the gun was. And she advised she loaded the gun with five dummy rounds before lunch. This is quite critical. Um, the gun holds six rounds and she loaded five. And so what this already shows is that lunch did interrupt this whole process of loading the rounds. Something that should have happened um, continuously and systematically that you check one round, load it. That's the first one. Check the second round, load it. That's the right second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and that's all of it. And then you've checked six out of the six rounds. In her case, she checked five dummy rounds and then went off to lunch. And so when you come back, are you going to know that you've checked that sixth one or not? Or are you just going to insert it? Oh, there's the sixth round, just insert it. Can you see how that could, that could uh, be a innocent way of making an error? I'm not saying an excusable way, but a way that kind of makes sense given the interruption for lunch. Hannah stated there was one round that wouldn't go in, and so after lunch she took the cleaner, cleaned it out, and put another round in. And what that means is she cleaned the, um, the area, I'm not quite sure what it's called, but it's the, the uh, chamber, I guess, inside the... Um, the barrel and then placed a different round into the one that she meant to put in and that w brought it to six rounds the question is did she check that sixth round and also if she did how did she check it Hannah described the gun to be a long barrel Colt 45 caliber okay so let's just go back to that again one round wouldn't go in then lunch happened, and then she put another round in. This final round after lunch may not have been a dummy. And it's possible after lunch, because she was caught up in trying to get this uh, round in, and they may have been pressed for time. She may have, there may have been this thing of, we need to get going, hurry up, right? Um, she, and she may have had almost panicked in the sense of, wow, I can't get this round in, I've got to get the round in and then cleaning it out and then rushing to put this sixth round in without checking the, the, that sixth round, right? So she may everything she did may have been systematic until the lunch break and then the rush after the lunch break. Bear in mind you would have had Alec Baldwin ready, on set, everybody else ready and everyone kind of waiting on Hannah. And she may have kind of fumbled and, and rushed, right? Um, I think she may also have assumed that she checked it before lunch when she hadn't. Many people have asked repeatedly the same question. How could a live round have gotten on set? I don't believe someone smuggled one in. I suspect live rounds and dummy rounds made their way onto set by the retrieval of previous production equipment, previous props. Somewhere along the line, in a prior production, live and dummy rounds were packed together. And you might think that's, that's not such a big deal. Filming is, is completed. It is the end of the shoot. And they are now just packing up and going to put it in a shed somewhere. You might think that's not a very big deal. And in a way, it isn't a big deal. The shoot is over. And so, you know, just pack everything away. The danger comes in where you're using this hastily packed away production equipment, props, dummy rounds, etc. And now they are mixed together with live rounds, which would, wouldn't be a factor when you've packed it away. You know, they're not going to do anything there. But when you now retrieve them, now it's the job of the armorer to make absolutely sure that you don't have a live round amongst the dummy rounds, but 
obviously assuming that they're all dummy rounds anyway, when they're not. So unfortunately, I don't think it was clearly inventoried, uh, inventoried the, um, the, the live rounds and the dummy rounds. Or if they were, if, if there was an inventory stating that, then somebody missed this crucial detail. Let's go back to the affidavit. Hannah advised they all went to lunch at 12.30 p.m. And after they came back, she and Sarah took the guns to the set. She said the guns were all in bags at this point and described the bags to look like socks. She stated the guns were checked on set. However, she didn't really check it too much, the firearm, due to it being locked up at lunch. Hannah said after she did the check, she put in the last round. So I, th I find that quite interesting is that, first of all, she admits I didn't really check it too much, which s suggests that she may have overlooked something. And obviously something was overlooked ultimately for this to happen. But it's also interesting she's talking about she didn't check the firearm too much. But what really needed to be checked is the rounds. And the other thing is that she says after she did the check, she put in the last round. And, you know, really what you want to do is check all, all, all the rounds at the same time. And the question is, was the last round checked? Also, was it the last round that became the first round that was fired? I think that's also important to, to establish. I also think that Hannah provides a counter, I think, to Baldwin's account in that she knew within seconds, perhaps no more than a minute, that a gunshot um, she heard was a gunshot. And that was the reason why Joel and Helena were both lying on the ground, bleeding. I mean, she assumed it. It was logical to assume, and that is what happened. So why on earth would Baldwin himself not assume it? Why would it not be his first thought instead of what he said was his last thought? And so right here is a critical moment. Hannah asked the director, this is in the affidavit, Hannah asked the assistant director if it was the gun if the gun is the reason why this happened. And Hall's immediately responded that it was. And so Hall also knew what had happened immediately. So one can assume Hannah and Hall's both knew hours and hours before Baldwin said he knew or guessed what had happened. Do you, t do you mean to tell me that Baldwin never spoke to Hall's while they sat side by side outside the church? I mean, there's a photo of them sitting side by side. Did they never speak to one another? And so I'm going to go to the affidavit to deal with the part that I've just mentioned. H Hannah advised a short time later she remembered she could hear the gunshot, then heard people calling for a medic emergency. Hannah said she looked in to see Joel on the ground, the director, and asked if it was the gun, to which Dave responded it was the gun that went off. To be clear... The affidavit should say, Hannah asked Dave Halls if it was the gun. Was it the gun that did this? And the assistant director responded to her that, yes, it was the gun that went off. And so you immediately had a sense of what had happened between the armorer and the assistant director. Well, one wonders where Baldwin was when this was said. And did neither of them say what had they'd said to one another to him? Did he not talk to either of them? One would imagine the first people he would go to would be either to Hannah or Dave to say, what's going on? Didn't he speak to them? So going back to the affidavit, Hannah said when she checked the gun after the incident, she checked the cartridge. And I think this is quite important as well. Hannah actually checked the gun after the incident, and again, didn't Baldwin, didn't anyone else, didn't Dave Halls, didn't uh, Baldwin check the gun, what was going on, Did, didn't he notice there was smoking, right? Didn't he notice the, what was inside it? So anyway, Hannah said she checked the cartridge, which would have been the one fired, and said the first one she pulled out didn't have that, pointing to the projectile end of a bullet. Hannah said she checked all the other rounds and they all had the ringing sound when she shook them or a hole in the side. 
indicating it was a dummy round. Hannah advised the box of dummies may have had some wonky rounds and they received the box approximately a week ago from Seth, Seth Kenny, her supplier. So Seth would also have to explain what was going on. I also think the, 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 her vocabulary here, calling something a wonky round, given what has happened, is, is a little bit of clumsy language. Also the way she says they didn't have that in, in terms of the, the projectile end of the bullet is something that doesn't sound very professional from the armorer, does it? it? Even the way she's talking about these aspects to her job, it just sounds quite casual and quite clumsy. And you heard at the beginning of this clip Hannah herself talking about not feeling quite ready. And obviously, I think that is the question. Was she ready for this particular job? Well, what do you think? What do you think the answer to that is? When Hannah states that she doesn't imagine there was any kind of conspiracy or nefarious plot, in other words, someone didn't intentionally load a live round into Baldwin's gun, I believe her. I don't think there was any malicious intent or any intent at all. But I do suspect that the real question here is about responsibility. It's a question that needs answering. It's a question that is being asked and it's a question that needs answering, especially if the so-called accident is to be prevented in, in the future. Does that make sense? It goes on to say, Hannah made a statement that she did not believe anyone in the film set would be that malicious to bring live ammo onto the set. I think it should be deliberately onto the set. Hannah confirmed when she was handed the gun after the incident, she was the only one to manipulate it and it was closed when it was handed to her. So no one else apparently looked at it. And what does that tell you? That they knew what happened or that they didn't follow up or that they didn't care what happened or that they didn't want to know what happened or that they thought they knew what happened. Alec described the gun to be a period cult. He said there were emails transferred back and forth between Hannah and him where she showed him different styles of guns. He said he requested a bigger gun and she also showed him different styles of knives for the production. Alec was shown a colt with a brown handle and a cherry handle and he ultimately chose the one with a brown handle. Now, Alec Baldwin has since gone onto Twitter. He's, he's reactivated his Twitter, but it's still set to private. And he's adamantly denied that he ever requested a bigger gun. And I think what he's talking about is the idea that it was requested sort of at lunch or that, that this request happened at the time, you know, on the 21st. I think... He's saying that it was requested months earlier. I'm not quite sure why he's being so defensive about that. It's possible that if the case is being made that the gun was requested that day, it may seem as if he was in control. He was calling the shots, literally. He was uh, also kind of, in a way, responsible for chaos, for people running around and not knowing what's going on and possibly uh, leading to this incident where the, the one bullet wouldn't fit in and it needed to be cleaned at the last moment and this rush. I'm just speculating that if, if this has been contended that he asked for a bigger gun at the last moment, that you could have a chaotic scenario ensuing where you've quickly got to clean this, this gun and set it up, if that makes sense. It remains to be seen what has been said in messages, in emails, in calls, in texts, what was said to the cinematographer and what comes through the cell phone side of things. Does it confirm that there's a request to change the gun at the last moment? And if so, from whom and how and when and where and all that? So in a previous video, I, I mentioned that I wondered whether Baldwin was at a something's got to give stage of his life. And I think the wanting a bigger gun fits in with wanting to be the big man to his young wife and six children. I'm just saying it fits in whether it is, is the case, whether it did happen, remains to be proved. We don't know if it's a fact. He has said it's not a fact. It's not true. So that remains to be seen. 
But if we take that psychology into the scene, you know, the, of wanting a bigger gun to be a bigger man, isn't the point of all the, th all the theatrics, isn't the point of all of this to eventually pull the trigger? Isn't that what cowboy movies are all about? Men pulling their triggers. And I want to spend a little bit of time on this idea and just take you to where it needs to go. Consider this analogy. Imagine you have a racing car driver, like a professional, someone like Schumacher or uh, Lewis Hamilton or Vettel or somebody that's just really at the top of their game. You take this racing car driver or even just a teenager who is about to take his first driving lesson. You know, he's, he's about to get his license. But someone who likes to be behind the wheel. And your, your idea in the scenario is, is just that the driver becomes familiar with the vehicle. To sit inside it, to get a feel for it. And so you, you hand the driver the keys. You fasten his, or he fastens his seatbelt. He adjusts the rear view mirror and gets told where he, where he should drive forward, uh, how to release uh, the clutch and everything else, and how to release the handbrake, and you know where the gears are and, and all that kind of thing. Isn't he going to want to start the engine? You know, isn't that the point of all of this? And that is the analogy for um, Baldwin in this scene, where he's dressed like a cowboy. He's, he pulls out his weapon. You know what is he doing except isn't he supposed to pull the trigger in a situation like that i'm just saying it's the same thing if you get behind the wheel with the keys aren't you going to be tempted to turn the key and start the car right if it's especially if it's a new car a new situation a new scenario and it's all been set up for you so the final point and this addresses the question about the true villain of the story we know this was a low-budget film. Baldwin himself called it that when he went on ABC earlier this month. He also referred to there being more work and time pressure on each person as a result. Now think about that more work and time pressure and a last-minute change happening and then there being a bit of a niggle with the one chamber and everybody waiting. Lunch has happened. Now it's time to get back to work. Well, everyone's waiting for you. Rush, rush, rush. And perhaps you don't check that last bullet um, the way you should have. I'm just speculating that that could have happened. Now, what I want to do is uh, have you take a look at Hannah's home. These are images of Hannah's home. The young armorer had limited experience. We all know that. She'd only worked as an armorer on one or two other sets, and there had been issues there too, including her handing a gun to an 11-year-old child actress without checking it properly and that led to everything stopping um, because of concerns around that. So in a scenario where there is a low-budget film, a lot of important concerns tend to be glossed over. It sort of feels like the issues on the old way in which the scenario I've just mentioned happened, it seems like some of those issues from the old way crept into rust and things got rusty. But consider also the decision to hire a young, inexperienced armorer. Whose idea was that? And wasn't it because she'd be cheap labor that she was hired? And isn't the idea behind being cheap that one tries to avoid paying the piper to get things right? And so if things go wrong, doesn't that psychology of being cheap and trying to avoid paying the piper remain? And so, who do you think was trying to avoid paying the piper here? Who is ultimately responsible here? So, I'm not going to take it further than that. we at around about half an hour. It's quite a long video. Uh, I will be doing, as I say, a live stream on those three critical questions raised by ABC in The Deadly Take. And I'm going to be trying to provide some of my answers to those the true crime rocket science take on the deadly takes three critical questions. So look out for that at two o'clock Eastern Standard Time. If it isn't today, if there's no live today at that time, it'll obviously be Sunday. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.